And it shook and went and we climbed up into the air. And we were flying along in this beautiful sunshine when all of a sudden it went black. And it was absolutely black and we heard the engine going and then it stopped. And the pilot opened the window and we could see him and there was a light, you know, coming through the window and he stuck his head out the window and he through the airplane and it went splash down on the on, uh, down on the water again, and then he got the engine going, purr, 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 and we went all the way back to Repulse Bay, and they cleaned off all the black oil off, the, you know, outside of the airplane. That's what made the airplane black, you know, dark inside, and they put new oil in the airplane, and then we took off again, and we were really scared, and the plane shook, and and we flew down to a place called Chesterfield Inlet. There was a school in Chesterfield Inlet and a residence for us. It wasn't exactly a residence. It was the basement, no, an attic of the Catholic mission. And they had beds in there and we went up there and, you know, and we slept uh, on those beds in the attic of the Catholic mission. And every morning, we had to go to school. And we lived with nuns and priests, you know, all year long. And I remember sitting in the back of the class on the floor and playing with these big blocks that had colorful ABCs on them and crying and crying and crying. And that's all I remember about my first year of school. But I learned one thing. Every morning, we had to climb down these stairs, and the church was right next door, and we'd go to the church. And every morning when I climbed down those stairs, there would be an old man sitting on a chair down at the bottom of the stairs. And when I came down, he would take me by my hand, and he would take me outside. And he would tell me all about the weather, and tell me what the weather was going to do that day. And he did this every morning, and one morning, I looked up at him and I said, why do you do this? And he said, what's your name? I said, Michel, because I was baptized by a French priest and I was baptized Michel. <coughs> and he said, me too. And he said, what else is your name? I said, Abdallah. And he said, me too. <laughs> and he said, what else? I said, no hadla. He said, me too. And he said, see, you're me and I'm you. And this is what I do every morning. And because you're me, this is what you have to do every morning. And so that year, I discovered who I was. And in the spring, the airplane came again. It took us back to Repulse Bay. We had a wonderful summer. And in the fall, the airplane came again. It was going to take us back to school, but I really didn't want to go, so I ran away. I hid in the hills until I saw the airplane leave. After the airplane left, I went home and I skipped school for a whole year. <laughs> but eventually I went back to school. And uh, anyway, when I was 12 years old, we moved to uh, Rankin Inlet, which is on the west coast of Hudson Bay, about halfway up, uh, exactly 300 miles north of Churchill, Manitoba. And um, I went to school there, but you could only go as high as grade five. Uh, it was a thing called a federal day school. And I took grade six by correspondence, um, and I don't know how I managed to pass. But the next year, I had to go away because it was too hard. And I went to uh, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, and I went to school there. And then I went to Churchill, Manitoba, and I graduated from high school in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I went to university there, and then I went to Ontario, and I learned how to fly airplanes, and went to Penticton, and learned how to fly uh, helicopters, and I met the old guy with, you know, take me to Alberta. <laughs> well, I didn't quite meet him, I drove by him. Anyway, and um, I went home 
I got married and now I have four boys. Well, actually I have five now. Um, anyway, when my boys were little, uh, I would put them to bed at night and when I put my boys to bed, they would say, Dad, can you read us a book? They would get a book and I would read to them. And one night, I got really, really tired of reading the same old book. You remember the one that goes, one fish, two fish, red fish, <laughs> I said, oh, you know, I'm really, really tired of reading this book. And in those days, you know, uh, that was uh, almost 30 years ago, there were no books uh, for kids um, about Canada. And there, you know, hardly, well, there were no books at all about, you know, Inuit kids in Canada. And um, so I put the books away and I told my boys a story. I told them about, you know, when I was a little kid up in Repulse Bay and we used to go out to these islands and um, my father and all the other men would go out on the sea ice right to the edge of the ice. And that place is generally called the flow edge. And it's a very dangerous place and they would hunt seals they would hunt walruses and whales and polar bears and all kinds of animals out there. And so the only people who were left on the islands uh, were us kids and our mums. And because it was springtime and the sun was up all the time, we didn't have to sleep at night. So we'd play outside all day and all night long. And one night we were out on the sea ice, you know, fishing through the cracks in the ice when all of a sudden all these bubbles started to come up and somebody yelled and we got scared, we dropped everything, we ran and ran and ran all the way back to the land. And when we got there, we stood on the rocks and we waited for the Kalupilui to come up out of the water. Well, my mother used to tell us about these Kalupilui. And she said, Kalupilui are old women trolls. <laughs> uh, they have a great big coat with a big pouch in the back to carry babies, but they don't have any babies of their own. So if you go down to the sea out by yourself, they will say, Aha, there's the little boy with no mother and no father. They will take you, they'll put you on their backs, they'll take you down under the sea ice, and they'll never bring you back. So we were always scared of those creatures, and one night I told my boys a story about them, and they said, Dad, why don't you write it down? So I wrote it down. And when I was all finished writing it, I read it to them and they said, Dad, it's really scary. <laughs> why don't you have it made into a book? So I got together with a friend of mine, a very good friend whose name is Robert Munch. And Robert Munch and I got together and we rewrote the story over and over and over until we were happy with it. And then we had it made into a book called A Promise is a Promise. So this was the very first book I wrote. And um, this is uh, the one that goes like this. We write in what is called syllabics. Uh, this is Inuktitut syllabics. There are Cree syllabics and Ojibwe and all kinds of, you know, First Nations languages. And, um, but when my publisher wrote this, you know, did this book, they didn't know how to read and write, so they didn't do a very good job of uh, proofreading. And even on the front page here, it's on the cover, it says, uh, which means written by, uh, that's me. Amma means also Bob Munch. Well, we call him Bob. We don't call him Robert. And, but they spelled his name wrong. Uh, they didn't call him Bob. They called him Pi. <laughs> so it's written by, you know, Avalu Kusuga and Pi Munch. <laughs> Anyway, it's been, it's, uh, there's an English version, uh, and here's a French version. Um, 
and I just got the other day a uh, Mi'kmaq version. Yeah. Well, I have a whole bunch of other stories. Um, after I wrote the first book, you know, I was asked to write an autobiography, and uh, my publisher asked for a 30-page autobiography, and I wrote about 45 pages, but I was, I think, something like 40 years old. And an autobiography or a story about, you know, a book has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, I wrote the beginning and I wrote the middle, but I couldn't figure out how to put an end. Like, this is a story about me, like, you know, I'm not ready to have an end yet. <laughs> so I was rereading all this stuff one day and I came across a nice little story. And it's a story about um, when I was a little kid, you know, the year I skipped uh, school in Repulse Bay, I was seven years old. And just before Christmas, another airplane came. And this airplane um, landed on the sea ice and we discovered that it had brought these trees. And they took all these Christmas trees out of the airplane and they put them on a snowbank. And we looked at them and we said, what are they? <laughs> because we had never ever seen a tree before. A friend of mine said, they're standing ups. He said he had seen them in books at the church, so we asked him, what are they for? He said, I don't know. <laughs> because we had never ever had Christmas trees. So we left them out in a snowbank and we forgot all about them. But you know, at Christmas I used to get one of those little rubber balls. You remember the ones that are red and blue and they have a white stripe around the middle? And we loved to play ball. And whenever I got one of those rubber balls, we would go outside, we would look for a stick to use for a bat, and when we found a little stick, we would carve a little handle on it, and we would play ball all day long. But there are no trees in Repulse Bay. And when there are no trees, you can hardly ever find a stick to use for a bat. <laughs> in 1955, the year I skipped school, there were trees in Repulse Bay. There were those six Christmas trees that the airplane had brought. And one day, another friend of mine was looking at those Christmas trees and he said, I know what those things are for. We said, what? He said, baseball bats. <laughs> so we ran and we got an ax and we chopped off all the branches from one of these Christmas trees and we made it into a baseball bat, a real round bat. It was the best Christmas present we ever got. We played ball all spring and all summer long, and every time we broke a bat, we would just go and get another Christmas tree and chop off all the branches and make another baseball bat. And in the fall, we ran out of Christmas trees. And we could hardly wait for Christmas when that airplane would come back and it would bring us more baseball bats for Christmas. <laughs> And that's why I call the story Baseball Back for Christmas. Well, if you don't know how to read in French, we have one in Czech. Um, in, or if you don't know how to read in English, we have one in French. If you don't know how to read in French, we have one in Japanese. <laughs> and if you don't know how to read at all, we made a movie. <laughs> Well, that's what I do. I have uh, 15 books that have been published uh, over the years, and, and we just recently um, made a CD. Uh, this CD is called uh, Inuit Songs and Stories. Learn how to throat sing. I don't know how to throat sing. But uh, we have these friends from, uh, uh, one friend from Rankin and that one from Alcviet in Nunavut and they came down and, and they did a little, little demonstration of how to throw things, you know. And so we recorded them um, teaching us how to throw things. And, um, and in that book or in that CD I also tell a story about an orphan boy whose name is Kavyagyuk. And people have always called it, you know, the Inuit uh, Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. but, it's our own. Um, well, 
you know, sometimes the wind blows, and when the wind blows, there is so much snow flying around that you can't see anything at all. And if you go for a walk, you get lost right away. So when I was a little boy, sometimes we had to sit in our igloos for a long, 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 long time. And it got to be really, really boring. Because we had no televisions, we had no radios, we had no videos. Uh, we didn't even have any books. So I'd sit there and I'd say to my grandmother, Ananitya, I am so bored. And my grandmother would say, why don't we play a game? <coughs> and I'd say to grandmother, we don't have any toys. And my grandmother said, but we have the best toy in the world. And she would reach into her pocket and she would take out a piece of string. I said, Grandmother, that's not a toy, that's just a piece of string. And my grandmother said, but this is very special string. This is magic string. This is string that does not like to be tied to your fingers. It always comes off and she would tie up her fingers like this. And sure enough, her string always came off. <laughs> and she would say, even if you tie up your fingers really good and tight, this string still does not like to be tied to your fingers. It always comes off. And she would tie up her fingers really good and tight like this. And sure enough, her string always came off. <laughs> and she would say, even if you tie up your fingers any old way, just tie them up any old way like this, this string still does not like to be tied to your fingers. It always comes off. <laughs> and she would say, you couldn't tie up anybody with this string. Can I tie you up? <laughs> <laughs> you tie it, what you mean? Ethan. Ethan. Oh, what a nice day. And uh, I'm going to tie him up. Actually, we're going to become really famous, you know. We're going to travel around the world. And Everywhere we go, people all yell, Yay, there's Ethan and Michael. They're great magicians. <laughs> and we will stand on the stage and we will bow. Bow. <laughs> okay, put, put up your hands like this so everybody can see, okay? And I will tie them up. There we go, all tied up. I think we should tie them up more, don't you think? All tied up. But you know, Ethan is really magic. You can't tie him up. He always comes off. <laughs> so we played with the string for a long time, and before we knew it, the wind was all gone. We could go outside to play again. We played, you know, games like cats. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed yourselves.